Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Welcome here. And uh, it's a great honor for me to be uh, here with all of you tonight. Um, as Alexi said, my name is Dan Merrill. I come from Salt Lake City in the state of Utah. Beautiful place out in the mountains. Come see it someday. Come ski it. You'll love it. Um, what I want to do tonight is share some of my excitement with you about neural interfaces, uh, also known as neural prostheses, and the various things that they can do to help people who have various neural disorders. Excellent. So um, what I'd like to do basically is for about 60 minutes, um, cover the following topics. Uh, let me first give you a working definition of what I mean when I say neural interface. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the organization of the nervous system. I, I think I've probably got a fairly mixed crowud here, so I want to give you Sure. That work? Yep. Nice and loud. OK. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the organization of the nervous system. Uh, I probably have some clinicians here, and I'll probably bore you, but I want to set a, a you know, basic context so we're all at the same level. Um, we'll talk about some success stories. So what are the applications? What are the things that we can use neural interfaces for? Um, I've got a couple of really nice videos I'd like to show you of some of these success stories. Um, we'll talk about some of the basics within uh, design of any medical device, which is effectiveness and safety. Now I'll give some examples of uh, design considerations with respect to those two things. Uh, we'll talk about some of our targets for neural interfaces, both peripheral and central. Uh, discuss some of the very specific devices that are being used. Some of those are made by my, by my company, and, and then we'll talk about other ones. And then finally, I'll end with some um, things for you to think about, for which I will not give answers, but just stuff that keeps you up at night worrying about uh, the future, so, or maybe not worrying. Uh, what is a neural interface? So, uh, question? Is that better? Okay, that good for everybody? Okay. Uh, so a neural interface, uh, my working definition is, it is a man-made device or system which connects to the human nervous system to do one of two things, either to record from it, which means observe what the uh, uh, nervous system is doing naturally, or to stimulate it to cause some effect. Um, and this is done for the purpose of either augmenting, which means improving, replacing or restoring lost functions of the nervous system. So for example, let's think of a stroke. So uh, a stroke occurs when a person has either a blockage of a blood vessel to the brain or a bleed in the brain. And some portion of the brain then uh, dies and we will lose the associated function with that part of the brain. So perhaps a person loses the ability to walk naturally or to reach out and grasp or lose speech or um, any of the functions of the brain. So what neural interfaces can do for us is to either allow us to immediately replace some of those lost functions or even uh, to uh, help aid the brain in repairing itself. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, um, I'm gonna try to not stand right in front of the screen talk a little bit about the organization of the nervous system. And I'll go through this fairly quickly, but just want to make sure everyone's at the same speed, same level. Um, essentially, we think of the nervous system as having three levels. So we take in a sensory input from the environment. We sense the environment, we process that information, make decisions about a proper behavior, or I shouldn't say decisions, process it to come up with a proper behavior and then send motor output to muscles or to glands. So as a few examples, uh, perhaps one of the simplest ones would be if I were to accidentally touch a hot stove, I'm gonna pull back very quickly. It's important that I do that quickly so that I don't hurt myself any further. What happens there is I have a sensation that's coming into me, a very uh, s uh, strong sensation from my thermal sensors in my fingers, comes into my spinal cord, doesn't go any farther, my brain doesn't process that, there are some very simple withdrawal reflexes mediated or, or executed by the spinal cord, which will then cause a contraction of my muscles. So sensation in, processing, motor output. Let's think of something slightly more complex. So walking. Um, I, I initiate a decision to walk with my brain, send that command down to the spinal cord, and at that point, my brain doesn't really get involved anymore. So there are uh, processing centers that we may refer to as central pattern generators in the spinal cord itself that allow me to walk. It drives the motor output 
my legs. I don't really think about that. My brain's not really involved. There is some sensory input because if I lose balance or if I hit a rock or something, then that sensory input will modulate or change the motor output of those central pattern generators. So again, sensory input, processing, motor output. Let's think about one more complicated level. So I've just got off work. It's late. I'm going home, walking down the sidewalk, and I'm hungry. It's about time to eat. Walk by a restaurant, and I recognize that smell. And Oh, my, that's really good. So I've taken in a sensory input, smell, process it in the context of my memory, years of eating good things and bad things. And the motor output becomes, I turn around and I walk into the door of that restaurant and I place an order. Now you might think, well, so you're talking about memory, that's a pretty complex thing and that doesn't quite fit into the sensory input processing output. But it does because really all memory is, is a, uh, a, a storage of prior loops of sensory input processing and output. So throughout my life, maybe I've had sensory input from some other smells or tastes, and I made a bad decision and ate something, and I'm not going to do it again. In this particular time, my, uh, my memory is that that smell is associated with a behavior, a motor output, which is good. So again, very simple mindedness, kind of a, a behavioralism uh, way of thinking about the uh, nervous system, but essentially input, processing, output. Okay, let's move on a little bit. Um, the nervous system can essentially be divided into two levels anatomically, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system are all the cells within the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is everything outside of that. And we can divide the peripheral nervous system up a little bit further. We can divide it both structurally and functionally. So structurally, we can divide it up into, as I was saying, inputs and outputs. So the sensory inputs or afferents are those um, uh, nervous system cells, neurons that are associated with bringing information from the environment into the spinal cord and brain. And then efferents or outgoing neurons are associated with taking the output from my brain or spinal cord and delivering commands to either muscle or glands. We can also uh, divide the peripheral ne nervous system up functionally into the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. So the somatic, also known as the um, uh, voluntary nervous system is that part which essentially I'm aware of. So, uh, for example, I'm sending out, I make a decision to reach out and grab something. Um, those those uh, skeletal muscles that are involved with my conscious decisions is part of the somatic nervous system. There's also a pretty big element of the nervous system known as the autonomic or automatic nervous system. These are things that happen subconsciously um, that can be divided into three levels, the sympathetic, parasympathetic and enteric nervous systems. So the sympathetic, uh, this is also known as the fight or flight. So this takes care of emergency situations. When uh, somebody is running after me and want to, wants to hurt me, I'm going to either run or I'm going to stop and fight. The parasympathetic uh, is known as the rest and digest. Uh, so this is kind of the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system that mediates when I'm in a, a, a mellow tone and I'm uh, just going through the uh, normal activities of the day, resting, digesting food, and so on. And the enteric uh, is one more uh, division of the autonom autonomic nervous system involved with uh, digestion, motility, and the gut. Okay, the neuron is the fundamental cell of the nervous system. I'm going to cover this pretty quick, and we'll get on to some exciting stuff. Uh, hopefully, this isn't all terribly familiar with all of you. Um, basic cell of the nervous system. So a cell is the fundamental organizational unit within the body. All tissues or uh, parts of the body are divided up into various cells. Neuron is for the nervous system. Its basic functions are to process information and to transmit it. So we can think of, uh, shown here are two neurons, we can think of a couple major parts. The, uh, the cell body up here contains the genetic information it has the uh, energy producing machinery because neurons uh, burn a lot of energy. Um, this is fairly large, so it's about a 20 to 100 micrometer diameter. So if, if you think of a millimeter, uh, my fingers pretty close together, about one tenth of that would be 100 micrometers. 
and that's right about the edge of your vision if you have good vision. So these cell bodies are actually quite large for a cell. They're just about at the edge of being able to see one. Coming out from there, we have an axon. This is a very uh, small diameter um, element, so it's about a micron across, or one one thousandth of a millimeter, but it can be very long, up to a meter long. So for example, I might have a single axon that reaches all the way from the bottom of my spinal cord down to my big toe, so very thin and long. Um, we can think of these, shown here are two neurons, we can think of them as connected in a chain, communicating uh, with uh, signal flow going downstream. Um, even though this is show, just shown one to the other, they're really not organized quite so serially. We have both convergence and divergence, meaning I may have several, uh, several axons that come together converging onto one cell body, or likewise, I may have an axon that breaks up uh, diverging out to several cell bodies. So that gives us a uh, fairly complex topology or neural networks. And the last thing I'll say here is that um, neurons have both electrical and chemical transduction in them. So throughout much of the neuron, we've got electrical activity and the form of what's called action potentials traveling down here, where neurons meet, called the synapse, shown here enlarged. There is a uh, chemical transduction. So if an electrical signal travels down here, when it gets to the end, there'll be a release of chemical neurotransmitters, which then causes, um, potentially causes electrical signals at the next cell. And this wouldn't be a talk on neural interfaces if I didn't show you some human brains, so here it is. Um, I, I won't do justice on this because I'm going to talk about it very briefly. Uh, the brain and spinal cord are the elements of the central nervous system. Uh, a few facts, the human brain weighs about three pounds. It's about 1,100 to 1,500 cc's in volume and it contains about 80 to 90 billion neurons. So for those of you who like numbers, that's a one with 11 zeros after it, large number of neurons. Um, seen in cross-section here, you may have heard the terms white matter and gray matter. So on the outside, the outer three millimeters or so is what's called the gray matter. That tends to be collections of the cell bodies, which we saw on the last slide. A lot of processing going on there. Uh, into the center, we see this white matter characteristic in, in anatomy. Um, the white matter tends to be a lot of axons, called tracts of axons. And it's white because these axons are covered in a, a, a lipid or fatty type material called myelin, which allows for uh, rapid uh, or, or increase in velocity, the speed of, the, of uh, uh, signaling. Okay, let's talk about, we'll get into uh, neural interfaces now. Um, some of the applications, so stroke. Um, we mentioned that earlier, stroke. Uh, is when we have either an, uh, a blockage of a blood vessel going to the brain or a bleed. It affects about 33 million people um, worldwide, large number. Uh, some of the uh, particular uh, uh, occurrences, uh, the sequelae of, of uh, effects with stroke often are, oops, are uh, loss of reach and grasp or lock of, loss of gait, the ability to walk. And these are both places where neural interfaces have been used effectively. Spinal cord injury. So this affects about a quarter to a half a million people per year worldwide. Uh, many different effects depending on how far down the spinal cord it happens. Uh, some of the more uh, devastating effects uh, if it occurs far enough up is we lose uh, some of the aspects of chest control. So we may lose respiration or the ability to cough. Neural interfaces uh, have been used successfully to stimulate the proper nerves to give back both respiration and cough. Uh, amputation, I'm gonna talk quite a bit about amputation tonight. Um, is that a, a nervous system problem? Does it seem like a nervous system problem? It actually is. Um, if I lose a part of a limb, that's affecting many different systems of the body. So for example, let's say there was a uh, mechanical prosthesis out there a hand and wrist prosthesis, there is, and I want to be able to control it. Well, a couple of the problems with being able to control that is I no longer have the nerves running outward to the hand to uh, send those signals, number one, and number two, I no longer have the nerves coming back from my fingertips to give sensation. So we're able to, and I'll show you some really exciting videos, we're able to uh, uh, restore that function, both the motor control of a, a fancy prosthesis as well as sensation coming back. Foot drop. So foot drop occurs when the front of my foot doesn't lift up during walk, it just drags along. 
And there are a lot of, uh, of causes of that. One of the most common causes is just uh, nerve damage uh, to the musculature of the foot. Pressure ulcers. So this is uh, skin erosion or skin loss when the skin rubs against something for too long. So for example, in either stroke or spinal cord injury, a person may not be able to roll over in bed the way they normally would. Uh, so bed sores, the same as pressure ulcers. Uh, cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy, uh, also known as perinatal stroke, is a stroke that occurs either in the womb or within the first two years of life. And as with any stroke, there are various uh, degrees of severity. Some strokes or some uh, cerebral palsy cases may have pretty minor effects. Others can be, others can be pretty devastating. Uh, facial palsy. So this is when half of the face becomes paralyzed. Again, many reasons why this may come about. Could be due to trauma to the facial nerve, could be due to tumors, it could be due to uh, secondary effects of a surgery to remove a tumor. So sometimes a surgeon is not able to avoid causing damage to the nerves, but it has to be done in order to remove a tumor. Uh, most commonly we see facial palsy uh, with uh, Bell's palsy. So this is uh, a, a condition where there's inflammation of the facial nerve. It often reverses itself, but not always. Uh, where did I go? Dysphagia. Dysphagia is inability to swallow. Uh, again, many causes of this. It could be uh, stroke, it could be throat cancer, could be secondary effects of surgery to remove uh, cancer. Incontinence and sexual function uh, affects many people. Uh, I don't know if this is true in Ukraine. It certainly is in the United States that uh, sexual dysfunction is really big business for the pharma companies. So um, this is something where we can uh, consider treating not only with drugs, but also with devices, uh, stimulation devices. And finally, nerve repair and regrowth. Um, it would be really nice if we can use neural interfaces not only to uh, artificially give back function, which we can, but if they could be used also to help promote the natural healing abilities of the body, and in fact, we can do that. <coughs> Bioelectric medicine or electroceuticals. Um, this is big business right now, and it's really recently popular. So I talked about uh, the autonomic nervous system earlier, or the automatic nervous system, which has control over uh, many of the organs in the chest, in the gut, in blood vessels. So that has effects on things like blood pressure. So if the blood vessels are constricted too tightly, then we have a lot of resistance, and that causes hypertension or high blood pressure. But uh, uh, electrical devices can also be used to treat that. Um, because the autonomic nervous system affects the gut, it is also affecting appetite and digestion, so it may have um, uh, some role in, in diseases such as diabetes or obesity. The basic concept with uh, bioelectric medicine or electroceuticals uh, means the same thing, is that instead of using drugs, we replace drugs with electrical devices. And one of the beautiful things about that is electrical devices in general tend to be more specific. So with drugs, there um, often are side effects that we may not desire. And that's a big part of the design of drugs is to eliminate those side effects but generally speaking, it is much more likely that an electrical stimulation device will have local effect only and less systemic effect with um, uh, uh, side effects that we may not desire. So is this a big market? Are there a lot of people that uh, this could potentially help? Well, the answer is yes. Worldwide, there's about a third of a billion, with a B, not an M, a third of a billion people with diabetes. Uh, obesity, about three-quarter billion of us are obese. Most of those are in the United States, by the way. Uh, hypertension affects over a billion people. And cardiovascular disease, about a third of the world will die from this. So these are some really big markets that can be um, helped with uh, medical devices, electrical stimulation devices. Okay, let me give you a few more definitions. Uh, Functional electrical stimulation versus therapeutic electrical stimulation. So with functional electrical stimulation, what we're talking about is the ability to immediately give back lost functions. So maybe a person has had a spinal cord injury or a stroke and they've lost the ability to walk. We can stimulate the nerves going to muscles 
and essentially immediately give back some very significant function to such a person. Uh, in therapeutic electrical stimulation, on the other hand, that's what I talked about before about trying to induce the nervous system to repair itself through uh, plasticity, which is the word that means the, the, uh, the brain and spinal cord's ability to rewire itself after injury. And we can really help uh, induce that natural repair uh, using electrical stimulation. Give you a few more definitions. Um, a neural interface we can think of generally as having two major components. So there's a set of electronics. So this is the uh, electronic devices that either uh, acquire and process information if we're recording or the sources that send out pulses of current if we're stimulating. If Oh, and the second part, uh, in addition to electronics, is the what we'll call the electrode. So that's the part uh, which I'll call the business end that's in contact with the tissue that either does the actual recording or the actual stimulation. So if I have both the electronics and the electrodes inside the body, nothing is outside, that's what we'll call an implanted device. An external device is one where the electronics are sitting outside, generally just sitting on the surface of the skin, and that can be further divided into uh, two categories. So a uh, transcutaneous device has not only the electronics, but also the uh, electrodes sitting on the outside. So for example, uh, just electrodes sitting on the surface of the skin, maybe recording what's going on under the skin, or maybe stimulating nerves under the skin. A percutaneous device, on the other hand, has electronics sitting outside on the skin, but then has leads or wires that dive down through the skin and the, the, ele the uh, electrodes are inside close to the, uh, the source or the target for recording or stimulation. A general concept from engineering is that instruments are designed to do one of two things, either to observe or to control. Or in the context of uh, neural interfaces, we'll call that sensing and stimulating. So a, a sensing interface is one which records the natural activity of excitable tissue, which means nerves and muscles, as they are conducting electrical signals. A stimulating device, on the other hand, is one which sends out pulses of electricity and causes signals to be sent down nerve and eventually cause um, either contraction of muscle, uh, uh, flow in a gland or natural perception of sensation. So let me give you an example that um, kind of illustrates the difference between sensing and stimulation. So spinal cord injury, it can be a, a rather devastating thing. So let's imagine a person has a cervical spinal cord injury in the neck and it's a very severe one. So what is happening now is even though the brain is working just fine, any motor signals going out to muscles don't make it down past the damage in the spinal cord. And any sensation below that injury doesn't make it up to the brain. So the brain is basically isolated from the rest of the body. It's a pretty devastating thing if you think about it. So a person with a high or a cervical spinal cord injury, they can't walk. They can't reach out and grasp. They can't feed themselves. They're generally incontinent. They can't enjoy sex. They can't wipe their own bottom when they go to the bathroom. This is a pretty devastating condition. So if you believe that you are your brother's keeper and you have a responsibility to help people, this is a good target for a person to help because they are really in need of it. Well, the good news is there are some things that we can do. So shown here is some work being done at uh, University of Pittsburgh. This is Rob Gaunt, Professor Rob Gaunt at UPIT. Um, he has developed a system whereby we can record information from the motor cortex of the brain. So this is the part of the brain that uh, is the, the last part of the brain that develops signals that are gonna go down to muscles uh, just before the signals leave the brain and go down the spinal cord. So it's the last point where we can capture information. That, and it's pretty well organized at that point 
um, as we move an electrode around on the brain, we move from finger to hand to wrist and so on. So it's pretty well mapped. So what we see here is a person with a high spinal cord injury. Notice these boxes of electronics up here. So this woman has electrodes placed in her brain in the motor cortex. Those electrodes are observing or recording information as she thinks about moving, trying to do something. And it's, again, it's pretty well mapped. So those electrodes uh, can detect whether or not she's trying to move a finger or a wrist or what she's trying to do. So then we have electronics that are um, decoding that information. This go, uh, actually, this is uh, not decoding, this is uh, amplifying and filtering. And then there's a cable that goes to a computer where we run a program that does the uh, decoding to determine intent to move, figures out what, that, what the brain signal is, what she's trying to do. And then the computer drives a robotic hand. And when this particular subject was asked, um, what is it you'd really like to get out of this clinical trial? Her answer was, I'd like to be able to feed myself. I'd like to be able to pick up a chocolate bar and feed myself. And what you see here is her first day of doing exactly that. She, is, uh, she got what she wanted. She's feeding herself a chocolate bar. This is just a still picture. I don't have the video from that. Um, what I'll show you next are uh, two sets of video, or two videos, really pretty exciting stuff, uh, about what we can do for amputees. So I'm going to focus on transradial amputation. So transradial means between the elbow and the wrist, so the lower part of the arm. Um, there are some really mechanically complex and fancy hand and wrist prostheses that can move almost like a normal natural hand, human hand can. A lot of gears, a lot of motors, they can do some fancy stuff. The problem is being able to figure out how to pick up the correct signals and decode them and send them out to drive those, uh, those processes. Well, over the last 20 years or so, we've done a pretty good job of being able to figure that out. So what happens is if a person has a amputation between the elbow and the wrist, the remaining muscles, we call them residual muscles, will still contract. So as a person thinks about closing the fingers on that hand that doesn't exist, the muscles, the residual muscles that used to go to that hand still contract. They just don't have a hand to connect to. But the muscles are still contracting mechanically. And in doing that, they are still generating electrical signals. We call those the electromyogram or EMG. And those electrical signals can be fairly easily recorded. So once we record those signals, we can then send them to a computer, decode them to figure out intent to move. And we can use that to drive the motors and gears on a fancy complex prosthesis. That's all well and good. It's a, a pretty fantastic thing. But there's another level that we'd like to go beyond that, which is really cutting edge. It's where the world is at right now. And that is, remember I talked about two parts of the peripheral nervous system. There's sensory information coming in, and motor information going out. So over the last 10 to 20 years, we've figured out how to decode that motor information going out. But what we have not done well is figure out how to give sensation back. So the, these fancy mechanical processes generally don't have the ability to feel, to, to, uh, to send information back so a person can feel. And part of the problem with that, part of the reason it took so long to figure that out is the, um, the patterns of electrical stimulation that have to be applied to a sensory nerve are really quite complex. So for decades, we've known how to stimulate sensory nerves, but people would always report that they just kind of feel a tingling or a buzz, and it's not really useful, it's not natural. The code or the pattern is complex, and there's really, about, there's really two people um, across the globe that recently, have, uh, about the same time, figured out the way to code the information so that sensation feels natural, so that a person can feel the difference between light touch or texture or vibration. So uh, the United States Department of Defense is really interested in figuring out how to implement this, since it given sensation back. So two years ago, they started a project called Haptics. It's 
stands for Hand Proprioception and Touch Interface. And its purpose is to develop closed loop systems whereby people can get not only control, but also sensation back. And, and the Department of Defense is interested because um, we owe it to our returning war fighters who have had amputations in war. For those who have given so much to their country, we owe it to them to give them back the best of technology. So there were uh, eight teams around the United States that were uh, funded to do work in this haptics program. Uh, Ripple, my company, is one of them. Um, what I'm about to show you here is work at the University of Utah uh, up in the corner here. This is Professor Greg Clark. He's one of our collaborators uh, running clinical trials. And I will show you a video of this person. What you're going to see is uh, this subject does not have a prosthesis on. He's going to be working in a virtual environment. So what that means is uh, this amputee, he's missing his left arm from uh, between the, the elbow and wrist. He's looking at a computer monitor. And on that monitor, he sees a hand. And that hand is reaching out for a door with a doorknob on it. So what we do, we've got uh, electrodes implanted inside his arm here. Those are made by my company. The, uh, the signals coming out from those electrodes that are deep inside muscle are decoded by a computer, which determines intent to move. And then those signals are sent to the computer and will drive that hand, the, the representation of the hand. So for example, if he wants to reach out to that doorknob that he sees, his residual muscles are still moving as if he's reaching we decode that and that virtual hand on the screen will follow it. Furthermore, when that virtual hand touches a surface on the door, signals will be sent back and they stimulate the ulnar and median nerves in his arm and give him a sensation as if he's touching that door. So uh, I'll show you the video now and what this, uh, in the video you'll see uh, the subject's response it will be the first time he has felt anything with that hand in 18 years. So his amputation was 18 years ago. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, this is so. This is what uh, drives biomedical engineers such as myself to do this. It, it's truly emotional and a thrill to be able to see a person uh, get back function uh, after so very long. Um, the next video I'm going to show you. Uh, this is Dustin Tyler. He's a professor at Case Western Reserve University, a, a colleague and a, a good friend of mine. Um, so he has actually moved a little bit farther along in the process than the last video you saw. So uh, what we see here, this is uh, Igor Spetnik. He is a fellow who lives uh, outside the Cleveland, Ohio area. Uh, uh, Dustin at Case Western is in Cleveland. Uh, Igor lost his arm in an industrial accident. A, a punch machine uh, destroyed his lower arm. And in this case, we have a real prosthesis. So what we see here is a rather complex hand and wrist prosthesis. Um, he has leads placed inside his residual muscles. The signals that come out from there are decoded by a small computer, which he wears on a, a belt pack. And then the, those signals, once they're decoded, determining the intent to move, drive the motors and gears here. Furthermore, you can't see them too well, there are uh, small pressure sensors in his fingertips. So when that prosthesis touches something, um, signals are generated and go back and uh, stimulate the sensory nerves in his arm. I recognize now there's one other point uh, I wanted to make, I haven't yet. Um, importance of sensory, sensory feedback. Uh, it, it is obvious, I think, fairly obvious, then when you get sensory feedback, you will have better control of the prosthesis. So if there's no sensory feedback whatsoever, and uh, I were to grab a styrofoam cup of hot coffee, 
the only feedback I have is to look at it. And if I'm not looking at it, I'm going to just crush it because I have no way of knowing how tightly I'm holding it. So, of course, we have better control. That's pretty clear. But there's another aspect, a more psychological aspect, which I think most of us um, didn't really anticipate until we, until we started giving sensory feedback. And that's um, the, the concept that's known as embodiment. So when a person has a prosthesis without sensory feedback, they tend to think of it just like a tool, just like a hammer that you hang off your belt and you pick it up and use it when you need it and then you set it down. And it's not a part of their, their own self-image. It's not a part of themselves. As soon as you give sensory feedback, almost immediately, their worldview changes. And as a matter of fact, their vocabulary changes. They no longer refer to, the, refer to it as a prosthesis or it. It becomes my hand. It becomes me. So they embody the prosthesis as a part of themselves, and they use it much more often. So uh, this is a, a fairly well-produced video from the university. Uh, showing Igor doing some uh, fairly complex things. You never thought of me being part of local research after the accident. I just thought I was going to be stuck at home with all here. Now I'm part of something big. This is now making an impact in the real world. Thank you, sir. This is not science that's going to send a shelf or be a Jewish paper. This is real. I think I think we're great. You never really know what you're looking until something happens. After losing his dominant right hand in an industrial accident five years ago, Igor Spedek was able to regain his sense of touch with an experimental prosthetic. The device is being developed by Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland VA Medical Center with support from the DARPA Haptics Program which aims to bring advanced prosthetic technology into the real world. Support also comes from the Rehabilitation Research and Development Service of the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. For three and a half years, Dustin Tyler's team has been working with Igor in the lab to perfect the system. So this is taking a lot of work, for sure. It's not just the sensors, but it's also connecting those to an external device that can record that information, transform that into the neural code, and then apply that into in See, he was able to hold that tomato. If you think about how a tomato feels, that's not something you can really do very well without sensory feedback. He also has the confidence to take a knife and cut. At Case, we at Case Western, they refer to that as the, the big honking knife video because uh, it's pretty impressive. 
Okay, um, last video I want to show you, and this is actually a pretty grainy or poor quality video, but I, I think it um, speaks highly to um, what we can do. So deep brain stimulation, uh, how many of you have heard of deep brain stimulation? Okay, good number of you. So um, this is, uh, the name is appropriate. With deep brain stimulation or DBS, electrodes are placed deep down into the brain. As a matter of fact, let me just slide forward. Here is a uh, x-ray. So uh, yeah, that's right in, into deep structures, down into the brain. So a, a pretty uh, invasive procedure. So people with movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease, and that affects about 10 million people worldwide, um, typically are treated with drugs first, but often the uh, ability, the effectiveness of drugs will wear off over a few years, or, or not wear off, but it becomes less effective. And for those people, uh, electrical stimulation into some of these deep structures in the brain uh, is very effective. Um, again, this is a not high quality video, but I think it really speaks for what uh, DBS can do. No audio on this one. So notice his feet. Um, very cautious. He can't take long steps. And we'll compare that to now, after stimulation. So he dances much better than I can. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I need a DBS, I don't know, but uh, uh, that's a pretty drastic change. And uh, deep brain stimulation is actually one of the um, uh, applications of electrical stimulation that's been around longer than any other. So that was already starting to be used uh, commercially by the mid-90s or thereabouts. Okay, let's move on a little bit now. Um, with any medical device or drug, there are essentially two things that need to be demonstrated, effectiveness and safety. So effectiveness means doing the thing it's supposed to do, and safety means not causing damage. Okay? And these are sometimes contradictory objectives. So for example, uh, some of the more invasive devices like deep brain stimulation, where I'm sticking something down deep into the brain, um, because it is invasive, it's a, a very serious surgical process. Um, there's infection risks, there's all the, uh, the risk of hemorrhage in the brain, there's all the risks of any surgery. Um, safety is a, a more significant concern than it would be if I were simply to put electrodes on the skin. However, often we can only get um, the, the level of effectiveness that we want when we put electrodes really close to the target, which means inside the body. So sometimes we have to trade off safety for effectiveness. Um, and a, a society or a culture is, I, I would submit, is often um, largely de defined by its willingness to accept risk. So, and I'd like, after this, maybe somebody can tell me a little bit more of your perception here in Ukraine. But in the United States, um, I would say our, our culture is very risk averse. People don't want to take chances. So the, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, which is responsible for approving devices or drugs, they've got a terribly hard job because the expectation of the American public is to get devices or drugs delivered to them that work really well but have no risk. And that's a nearly impossible task for the FDA. When I first started working in the medical device industry back in the 1980s, my perception and the perception within industry was that the FDA was a roadblock. They, they were just there, their job was to get in the way. And it took me a while to realize that after I started working with them that that's not fair because the real problem is not the FDA, it's um, our society in the United States has no tolerance for risk. So we can deliver a device, uh, we meaning the United States, can deliver a device that saves the lives of 100,000 people. 
And if one person gets injured by that device, then the Food and Drug Administration is going to be in trouble that they actually let that device go through. So it, it's, it's a problem. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, some specific devices and how we define effectiveness and safety. So for a stimulation device, um, to be effective means that it delivers enough electrical charge so that we get the desired uh, response that we want. Maybe it's contraction of muscle. Maybe it's uh, a, a perception if we're stimulating sensory nerves. And it also should be reliable, meaning that it not only works well after it being implanted, not just for a day, a week, a month, but hopefully for years. And safety means, um, it's a couple parts, um, and I will divide that according to active and passive properties. So the passive properties mean when I put a, a stimulating device and electrodes inside the body, even before I turn it on, I don't want the material properties of that device to cause a bad reaction inside the body. That's called biocompatibility. And then the active aspect is once I then turn it on and start delivering charge, I don't want to deliver too much charge because if I do that, then we'll start uh, having chemical reactions occur inside the body, which can cause damage. Uh, recording devices, um, we want them to be both sensitive and selective. Sensitivity and selectivity um, apply to any type of recording device. And the best way I can describe that, I think, I'll go back in history to where a lot of studies were done on sensitivity and selectivity. So during World War II, there was um, a lot of work done with, on radar systems. Radar systems whose job was to detect when the enemy bombers were coming in. So a lot of it done in the United Kingdom. Um, they wanted to know if there was a bomber coming in. So a sensitive radar system is one that properly picks up a very faint signal. So when the enemy's bomber is a long way away, and it's a very faint signal, you want to know that. You want to tell your people, there's something out there that I'm interested in. A selective system is one that does not respond to something that you're not interested in. In other words, when there's a flock of seagulls flying in across the coastline, you don't want to wake up your fighter squadron and send them out every single time, because pretty soon they get tired. So a perfect device is one that is both sensitive it picks up faint signals that you care about, and selective, which means it ignores signals that you don't care about. So uh, an effective recording device is both sensitive and selective, and furthermore, it should be reliable, meaning it lasts for a long time. And then safety, uh, since we're not injecting charge with the recording device, it's just a quiet observer, then we don't have the uh, issues with chemical reactions. The main thing here is just that its passive properties are biocompatible, so the materials that are used um, don't cause a bad reaction. One of the aspects of safety, if we're going to implant a device into the body, is to make it as small as possible. Obviously, if I put a great big chunk of metal inside the brain, that's not a good idea. I want it to be as small as it could be. So, uh, shown here, uh, this is uh, Joe Shulman. He was uh, a fellow I worked for years ago. He was a chief scientist at a, uh, a nonprofit uh, medical foundation. This is when he was a uh, graduate student at UCLA in 1963. And what we see here, uh, this contraption here is how much space it took to make a neural stimulator. So that's not an implantable device. That's a little bit too big to put inside the body. But go down many years later, 2005, here is an integrated circuit. It's about uh, one millimeter by five and a half millimeters long has the equivalency of about 20,000 transistors, and that is the basis for a device that that same person, Joe Shulman, de uh, designed um, that does the same thing as that big rack of instruments. And this uh, is an implantable device, fairly small. Okay, uh, let's talk about, <coughs> talk about a couple different targets for neural interfaces, central and peripheral. So remember the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord, Peripheral nervous system is everything outside of that. So uh, central interfaces, for example, deep brain stimulation, uh, tend to be more risky because they are invasive. So we have to have surgery. Um, all the risks of surgery are involved. Um, however, they often are more effective. Uh, peripheral 
interface SO, which connect to peripheral nerves, uh, tend to be uh, less risky surgical procedures. Uh, so as a few examples, uh, central interfaces, uh, we already saw deep brain stimulation. So this is uh, electrodes are placed deep into the brain. Here's an example of what's called an ECOG or electrocorticography. So these are electrodes that are sitting on the surface of brain. They don't go deep like they do here, but they sit uh, on the surface. So that's more invasive than an electrode on the skin, but it's less invasive than this one. This is a picture of uh, what's known as the Utah slanted electrode array. So there are um, a total of 100 electrode tips here in a 10 by 10 array. It's about, uh, these are separated by 400 micrometers each, so roughly two, uh, two millimeters by two millimeters. And these are very sharp little electrodes that are placed into either brain or peripheral, uh, peripheral nerve. They can be used uh, either centrally or peripherally. So as examples of peripheral nerves, uh, peripheral interfaces, here we see the Utah electrode array, this thing. There's three of them placed into the ulnar, radian, and medial nerves for sensory uh, stimulation. So that first video that we saw of the person that was reaching out to the virtual doorknob, uh, this is what he has, his Utah electrode arrays. Uh, yes, the, the next video we saw of the person with uh, the full prosthesis uses a slightly different technology. It's called the FINE, the uh, flat intrafascicular nerve electrode. So this one is, uh, belongs to a general class of electrodes called cuff electrodes. So they go around the outside of a nerve. So it's less invasive than this, but more invasive than say uh, an electrode that sits on the skin. Okay, let's define effectiveness and safety uh, in some real applications. So I'll start out with uh, recording from the brain and I'll give you three different examples of places that we can place electrodes and we'll talk about uh, effectiveness and safety for each of those. So uh, electrodes placed on the scalp, electroencephalogram. The terms I'm gonna use for sensitivity and selectivity, I, I will define as follows. So for <coughs> selectivity, I will define the, the volume of tissue for which I can resolve where a signal is coming from. So if I said um, for an electrode placed at some, some unspecified location, if the best I can do is tell you, well, that signal I'm picking up is coming from the left half of the brain or it's coming from the right half of the brain, that's not very um, selective. That's a pretty big volume. On the other hand, if I can resolve down to a cubic millimeter, that's much better. So for selectivity, uh, my criteria is I want uh, a small number. For sensitivity, the way I'm gonna define that is for any given signal in the brain, how big is that signal by the time it reaches the electrode? So I want that number to be big. I want a, a big signal by the time it reaches my electrode. So for uh, scalp or electroencephalogram recordings, uh, I can resolve to a region of about six to eight cubic centimeters. And my sensitivity, so if a signal is firing somewhere in the brain, I will pick up signals on the order of 10 to 100 microvolts, fairly small. Invasiveness, um, minimal. Most any of us would be willing to do this right now. It doesn't hurt, it, it's not dangerous. Let's go to the far end of the spectrum now. So we'll talk about penetrating uh, microelectrodes. So, Again, here we see the Utah array previously. So these have much better selectivity, as you might guess, because they are deep in the brain and they are very small electrodes. So here we can resolve to about a cubic millimeter. So I can tell much better where a signal is coming from. And also because I'm uh, putting electrodes close to my target, we get pretty big signals, up to a few millivolts. So that's uh, with an electrical circuit that's really easy to work with. If you give me something on the order of millivolts, no problem, I can figure out what's going on. Other hand, the invasiveness is high. So this is a high risk profile. Uh, it's much more risky than this. If, if I were to ask by a show of hands how many people would rather have this than this, I think I can tell you uh, what the answer would be. Well, there's a middle ground, which is known as electrocorticography. And in electrocorticography, what we do is we place electrodes on the surface of the brain. So here we're out on the scalp, not very invasive. 
Here we're penetrating needle type electrodes, so that's really invasive. This is kind of the middle ground because we still have to open up the scalp, uh, open up the scalp, open up the skull, but we don't go deep into the brain. So this is uh, kind of medium invasiveness. Um, and likewise, its effectivity, effectivity is also medium. So the uh, selectivity is uh, less than a cubic centimeter. So much better than this, not as good as that. And the sensitivity is up to hundreds of microvolts. So better than this, not as good as that. Let's go through that same exercise of safety and effectiveness. Uh, now we're not going to talk about brain, we're going to talk about recording from muscle, and I'll uh, compare two different examples. One is uh, when we have surface electrodes just sitting on the skin, and the second will be when we go uh, deep into muscle. So with surface, surface electrodes, this type of recording has been done for a long time. Uh, really not invasive. It doesn't hurt. We're not injecting charge or anything. We're just recording. So um, this is painless other than maybe ripping a little hair off if you don't shave beforehand, but it's generally painless. Um, the selectivity and sensitivity, I say, are modest. Uh, well, that's not a very satisfying answer, so let me give you a better answer. In prosthesis control, I mentioned before that there are some really complex hand and wrist prostheses out there that have um, almost all the function of a normal hand. The, the prosthesis itself, the motors and gears, can do this sort of thing. Very fancy. But the problem is it's challenging to get the control signals from inside the body out to do complex movements. So if we have surface electrodes like this, and we're trying to drive a complex prosthesis, what people have to do is drive, either, uh, drive only one mode at a time. So let's say I want to twist the wrist this way and close my fingers. Using surface electrodes, it's not possible to do that at the same time. You can't do that simultaneously. What a person with a transradial amputation using surface electrodes, which is pretty much what's been done for many years now, would have to do is they first rotate the wrist, then they squeeze their arm really hard, it's called a co-contraction, and the electronics will sense that they're co-contracting, meaning trying to just squeeze everything they can at once and then the electronics will change the mode of what it's doing, and then they can close the fingers. So to do this, they go and it's not natural at all. It's not very satisfying. On the other hand, if we use an implanted device, and um, this is made by my company. I have one tonight. If any of you would like to see it, come talk to me afterward. Um, this is an implantable device. So what we have is, this is a small uh, ceramic hermetic package, which is placed underneath the skin. Coming out of that package are eight electro or eight leads. Each one of those leads has four electrodes on it. So eight times four, that's 32 channels of recording. And these leads, this sits just under the skin, and then these leads dive down deep into various muscles of an amputee. So what happens is, because these go close to the source of the muscles that are contracting, we get really nice, clear signals from each individual muscle. The invasiveness of this is uh, clearly much more than this one, because it's implanted. Um, but the prosthesis, of, of, sorry, the, uh, the uh, effectiveness of this, I can define in terms of prosthesis control. So whereas with the surface control, we have to do one mode at a time, rotate, co-contract, do this. With this type of device, we're able to have simultaneous multi-degree of freedom control. That's the, the phrase in prosthesis. With this, we have sequential multi-degree of freedom. So a degree of freedom is a type of movement. So with surface, it's sequential, one at a time, multi-degree of freedom control. One, co-contract, another one. With implanted devices, it's basically natural movement, so we get simultaneous multi-degree of freedom control. Okay, uh, technologies of the future. And I have a few 
future uh, with a question mark after it because even though some of these are not yet uh, implemented widely in clinical practice, these are all uh, ones that have been demonstrated, at least on the bench, uh, generally in animals and uh, generally uh, in early clinical trials. So what are some of the types of things we would like to do in the future to make neural interfaces better? The immune system, the body, is a beautifully tuned system, and it has two basic roles. One is to recognize the difference between self and foreign. In other words, if there's something in the body, whether it's a bacteria or a piece of a stainless steel electrode, the immune system needs to recognize whether it belongs or not. It, it labels it. Yes, you belong, you're part of me, or no, you don't belong, you're foreign. And the second thing the immune system does is once something is labeled as foreign, it will either destroy it or at least wall it off. So it's very good at recognition, and there are a number of different types of signals that it, the immune system uses to recognize if something's foreign. And one of the signals is if something is mechanically different than the body. So the body is generally soft, and if we put something in it that's very hard, like a wire, that in and of itself is a signal to the immune system that you don't belong, I'm gonna get rid of you. So one of the things we like to do in uh, developing technologies is make really super soft, flexible things and trick the immune system that I belong, I'm, I'm not foreign. Another thing that's being done is to develop uh, organic devices that conduct, sometimes called inherently conducting polymers. So this is like a, a plastic, but it has the electrical properties of a wire. Um, one of the types of materials that's been investigated is called PDOT. And this is, whoop, not too far. Uh, this is a, a, a long chemical name, which I don't remember off the top of my head, uh, but it is inherently conducting <coughs> polymer like this uh, material here. It's very soft, flexes with tissue. And another really cool thing about PDOT is once it's put inside the body, it tends to star out, makes a lot of uh, long, thin projections. So what happens, uh, here we see PDOT in uh, a rat brain, and what happens is even if the body tries to wall it off, and it will, the nervous system is good about doing that, um, the scar that is formed around that PDOT in the middle, there will be projections of the PDOT that extend out past the scar, sometimes called an astroglial scar. And since it extends beyond the scar, pokes right through it, that means that we still get good recording and stimulation because the far ends of those, uh, those spikes go out past the scar. And then the last thing is, um, in order to get a better understanding of how the nervous system works, uh, we need to get smaller and smaller devices that get down uh, on the spatial dimensions of the brain itself. So shown here, is a, a electrode array. This is uh, 360 electrodes. Uh, they are 500 micrometers or a half a millimeter apart from one another. So this is getting down um, to what would be called the, the columnar organization of the brain. So um, the brain has columns of neurons organized with similar properties and they tend to separate um, from one another by about 500 microns. So this is uh, kind of the state of the art where we're at right now as far as getting small devices. All right, so the last slide tonight, thanks for bearing with me. I'm gonna give you some things to uh, take home and think about. And I'm not gonna give you any answers to this because I don't necessarily know the answers, but there are some pretty fascinating things. So what are some of the problems, some of the ethical issues that we need to consider as we uh, progress forward with uh, neural interfaces? So one of my concerns, the things that I personally struggle with, is how do we fairly partition, um, excuse me, I'm getting myself. Um, who, who do we allow to make the decision about where to balance effectiveness versus safety? So let's say you or a loved one is struck down with a very serious, debilitating nervous system disorder and you start losing control of your body. So first you can't walk, and then you can't reach out, and you start losing ability to use the muscles throughout your body. Terrible thing. And it happens to be such a rare disease that there aren't many people working on it, on trying to get you a solution. But somewhere in the world, 
there's this one person who's figured out the solution. They've got the device. And it's not cleared for use. No government has taken that on to approve it for general use. And this one investigator has demonstrated it to work well, not only uh, in the lab, but also in animals. And there's good proof of it. You have high confidence that will work in you. Um, however, there is a 5% chance that if you get this device, you're going to die. So here's your choice in front of you. You can for sure live for another 6 to 24 months with a moderately, rapidly progressing, highly disabling disease that where you watch your uh, ability to control your body go away from you. And that's going to happen for sure. Or you can spin the roulette wheel and take a 5% chance of dying. But if you take that chance, the other 95% says you're going to have a near normal life back. Who gets to decide? Who gets that decision about whether you get that device or not? So as I told you, in the United States, um, we have a pretty risk-averse culture. The FDA would never approve that. They'd hear 5% chance of dying. Nope, you're not going to approve that. So that's not going to become available through normal channels. <coughs> Should it be your decision? Should you get to choose that? Do you want to let the government decide? I don't know, but it's a, big, it's a tough problem. I think we can agree that, to that. Um, implantable devices uh, tend to be not only complex, but expensive. So a uh, rule of thumb is an uh, uh, implantable device takes 10 years and $100 million to make. It takes about two years to get the proof of concept, and then the rest of the, the, the next eight years you spend um, hardening it, uh, taking it through animal trials, through all the qualification tests, proving it to a high level of confidence that it can get approved, then going through the regulatory hurdles with the FDA or whoever your regulatory body is, applying for intellectual property rights so other people won't steal it from you. All the administration, that's 80% of the work. So they're expensive. So if you have uh, some disorder that can be solved with a neural interface, and the only neural interface that is available is really expensive, how does that get paid for? And every society has different ways to answer that, uh, but it's a problem. Uh, let's say the government doesn't help you. You don't have that kind of a system. But it's available if you have a thick enough wallet, enough cash. Does that mean we start getting into a class stratification where only the wealthy can stay healthy? It's a tough problem. OK, here's the one that's going to give you strange dreams tonight. And this is a fun one. Memory replacement. So there is a fellow, his name is Ted Berger, Professor Ted Berger. Look him up, B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E He's at the University of uh, Southern California, who has begun to make memory prostheses and demonstrated it in rats. So the experiments that Professor Berger has done <laughs> is to put electrodes into the hippocampus of rats. So hippocampus is the part of the brain that's responsible for uh, consolidating memory, moving memory from short-term to long-term memory formation. So he puts fine wire electrodes into the hippocampus of rats and then has, it trains them in mazes to run through the maze and get the cheese at the end. That's the reward. And as the animals learn the maze, they are developing memories and they get faster and faster running through the maze and get into the good cheese. So all along he's recording this and storing it on a hard drive or a CD or, or where he stores information. And then he will give that same rat drugs that uh, lesion or destroy their memories. So then he puts them in the maze and they look around like they, you know, what is this thing? Never seen it before because they've lost their memory. Then he plays back the CD and instead of recording, he's stimulating and they run through the maze he electrically gives back their memories. This is real. This is going on right now as we talk. So think about the next step from that. What if, and by the way, rats' brains, even though I'd like to think otherwise, rats' brains are not that different than mine. They're actually a pretty good model. 
um, m maybe not that close to yours, but they're pretty close to mine. Um, thank you. Uh, the next step, after giving back an individual rat its memory, and as far as I know, he hasn't done this. It's not published, but maybe he has. What if he doesn't give back a memory to the same rat, but what if he plays it back to another rat? What has he just done? He has transferred the experience of one animal to another animal. So I don't know if he's done that yet, but it's really close. If he hasn't, he probably has. And once he demonstrates that, he can probably be done with humans. Risky, but the proof of principle is there. So let's take that another step. What's to say we can't start taking um, the records, the memory of a person who has climbed Mount Everest and suffered all the, the challenges and the hardships of doing that. And then one night I'm sitting in my easy chair at home and I think, I want to climb Mount Everest. This is going to be fun. So we're going to jack me in. How, how many of you seen The Matrix, the movie The Matrix with Keanu Reeves? Any of you know that? We're on the road. It's not there yet, but we're on the road for that. So if we start giving people someone else's experiences or totally fabricated experiences, at what point do we lose a sense of self-identity? When is it not me anymore because I didn't actually do those things? I mean, besides the fact that I didn't earn them, it seems like kind of a slippery slope about where I lose my self-identity about being me versus being somebody else. Am, am I just a big part of the Internet of Things now because I'm so connected that uh, you know, I'm a part, of, a part of everything? Maybe that's the answer. I'm not giving you answers on this slide. I'm just bringing up questions. Good things for you to think about. Um, and then the last one, uh, this is a little more obvious, uh, is <clears throat> replacement versus augmentation. So it's a little obvious to me that uh, as biomedical engineers and physicians and others, um, it is a worthwhile goal to help people who have lost function, so amputees or people who have suffered stroke or spinal cord injury or so on, uh, give them back what it takes to be normal, make them themselves again. But pretty much the same technologies that are used to give back function can then be applied towards a sound or normal person to make them better than they were, make them stronger, make them smarter, give them better memory. Are we okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What about the issues? It sounds good. I'd like to be smarter. I'd like to be stronger. I'd like to have all those things. What if it's uh, really expensive? Who pays for it? Are we creating a class stratification where the wealthy become smarter and therefore wealthier and, and therefore wealthier? Anyway, it's going to happen. Okay. Well, this intent was uh, this slide was uh, intended to make you think. So it looks like I've succeeded there. Um, and with that, I am finished. So, Doja uh, Kobe Jafuya. So, let me have a QA session, and uh, if you don't mind, I will start. <laughs> I have a microphone. So, uh, <laughs> small question. Uh, it's uh, really good to have such devices, but already, uh, always there is a question about energy. So, uh, what can you say in a couple of words about uh, state of the art solutions in uh, energy uh, for these devices? And uh, what are the main issues with them? So, how to power them up? Yeah. So, so the question is, how do we uh, power them? Uh, excellent question. So one of the things that we consider, th there's a few different ways that can be addressed. So if we have a, an implanted device, then one of the first questions is, 
does that device have a battery inside it or is it powered wirelessly? And there's good reasons to go either way. Um, often we will want to have a wireless type device. So there is a inductive or magnetic coupling of power from outside like a transformer that delivers power. And the advantage of doing that is uh, we're not putting a chemical source, a battery, which in and of itself is a dangerous thing inside the, inside the body. Um, if I do want to put a battery inside the body, then my choice is that the decision tree branches to either having a rechargeable battery or a, a primary battery, which has a, a certain lifetime on it. Now, a lot of primary batteries, this fellow that I showed you with the big apparatus on his desk, and then he made it into a small integrated circuit. Another one of his claims to fame was early on, uh, he and another fellow uh, took the batteries that went into cardiac pacemakers and made them last about five to 10 times as long as what had existed before. So now uh, some of the implanted devices, we can get primary batteries that last for upwards of 10 years. So that kind of puts the, uh, the limit on how long you can keep a device inside the body with a battery before you have to pull it out. And 10 years is a pretty long time. So then you question, am I willing to have a surgery at least every 10 years? Maybe the answer is yes. Your other option is to have a rechargeable battery inside uh, the device. If you do that, then you will have to, um, on a, a regular basis, maybe once a day or once a week, uh, sit next to a charging coil. And there's lots of ways you can do that. Maybe you can do it while you sleep or while you're at rest one way or another. The other option is if we don't have, um, uh, uh, back up a little bit, uh, if, if we don't have batteries inside the device at all, but want to just power them inductively so there's only a coil inside the device and then a coil outside, that gives us some freedom. So now the limitation on power comes to uh, how compact can I make an external battery that's sitting outside the body. So how compact can I make it? How often do I want to replace it? So for example, with um, prosthesis use, which is one of the things that I was talking about a lot tonight, uh, generally people have these fancy mechanical uh, hand and wrist prostheses will have an external battery and uh, those are rechargeable and typically they last for, it, it's considered a win if they can last for a full day, so say 12 hours of use because then they can take the prosthesis off at night and when, they're, when they don't need it they can then recharge that battery. So we have microphone. The image that in, uh, in, like in highly modern you know, interface, how often do you need to repeat the uh, repeat procedure in order to keep them working? Because it's one thing if you need to repeat the procedure like once in two years, and another thing if you need to repeat it every month. So the question is, how often do we have to repeat surgical procedures? Um, it, it's on a case by case basis depending on what the particular limitation is. So if you have a mature technology, one that's been around for a while and it's working well, then most often the limitation is what I just spoke about, the battery. And those are up to maybe 10 years. So a fairly long period of time. One of the interesting things um, about that with, with cardiac pacemakers, even though uh, the batteries last about 10 years, uh, people will often get surg or choose, optionally choose, to get procedures, more, surgical procedures more often than that. And the reason is because even though they don't have to, the technology continues to mature and they, the, the technology gets better and better. So the person that has this device in them, they don't need to get replaced. And then they go and they look on the internet or read or they hear from their doctor that there's a new device that has better performance. Maybe it's smaller or maybe um, it has better reliability or one thing or another, and they will choose to get a surgical procedure even though it's not necessary. So the quick, quicker answer to your question is case-by-case case basis. It depends on what the limiting factor is. It, the best case scenario usually is that the battery itself is what will limit, and we're up to now in the range of 10, maybe 15 years. I want to ask you, you always talk about some um, 
body. Uh, do you have clients who want multiple hands or something more fun? <laughs> so, so you're talking about something um, better than the normal, the the usual hand. Yeah. So that is kind of the last last point about augmentation there on the last slide, right? So often, at least in in my case, through most of my career, um, my research is directed by chasing the money. And what I mean by that is development of medical devices is really expensive. And because it's really expensive, you will tend to figure out, no, no matter what you want to do, there's a hard reality that you have to find the funding to do it. So where is the funding at? Generally, it's not for augmentation, making something better. It's for replacement of lost function. So within the company I'm at right now, we're a small group, there's about 30 of us, and 80% to 90% of our revenue comes from uh, federal grants. So from the National Institute of Health or the Department of Defense, who has various interests. And those interests generally are not in augmentation. Now, now that I've said that, I'll tell you there's one exception, which just recently came out. So here's another thing to write down to look up on the internet. Um, it's called uh, TNT. Let's see if I can remember. Targeted neural, targeted neural, oh, what is it? I, I'm, I'm missing it. Uh, it'll come to TNT. So this is a new grant from the US Department of Defense. Someone can figure out while I'm talking. Um, and it is exactly about improving uh, cognitive performance of soldiers. So getting them to learn tasks faster. And the interesting, it's a brand new call from the Department of Defense. And the interesting thing about it is it is the first time I have ever seen where there was a major um, call for proposals from the United States government for something, a uh, medical device, that is not replacement of normal function, it is advancement. So, you know, the sad answer is, do you find it? No. The, the, the sad answer is we have... Thank you. Targeted neuroplasticity training. Well, okay, yes. So the, the, the question here, so that's a translation from um, uh, treating disorder to augmentation. So we're, we're, there's now money available is the point to finally move from replacement of normal up to making something, uh, augmenting or making better. <coughs> Thank you for this very comprehensive uh, You're welcome. discussion and uh, lecture. And uh, when we are talking about um, the rats having memories of other rats, mm -hmm. right? Um, what if you really do this transplantation and then uh, do you have any evidence uh, or know about any evidence that this uh, transplantation of memory will work in the sense that uh, they will be able to use these other experiences? And even if they do, uh, does it work? or will it work with the human? For example, uh, will it affect our ability to speak or other ability to stress on health? So uh, I think there's two questions there, if I understand that right. One is, can we translate from uh, giving memory back to the same animal to another animal? And then the second is, can we translate from rat to human? Um, my speculation is the first challenge is the harder one going from one individual to another individual. Um, no doubt that is very difficult because the electrodes that are placed in a given rat are at some proper location and there's a, a particular pattern being recorded from that set of electrode locations. And then when it's 
played back, it's already in the right place spatially for that animal. So to get it positioned back perfectly in another animal is a tough uh, neural anatomy problem, right? If that can get solved, um, I would submit that taking it from rats to humans is uh, going to happen. Because, again, I, I joke saying I'd like to think that I'm smarter than a rat, but you know the fact is um, our, our uh, basic structure is not that far apart. That's why you know, rats are used a lot in brain studies because people don't care that much. They're rats. It's easy to get it passed through, through your <clears throat> regular pro regulatory protocol to study a rat. And once you gain information, it generally translates quite well into humans. Oh. Focal what sound ultrasound? Focus, uh, ultrasound simulation. What? Uh, why did I not? Why did I not talk about that? Yeah, because it is not invasive and uh, it uh, provides opportunity to simulate deep brain structures. So uh, one of the issues there is, I, I think, the, the portability of doing ultrasound stimulation. So it's a, a, a larger, substantially larger device that a person would have to wear. With the deep brain stimulation, it's pretty uh, discreet. So they have a pacemaker-like device that's placed uh, subclavicularly right here in the same place a pacemaker would be, and leads that go up, and you don't really see it. So with ultrasound, although there's a lot of fascination in its ability to emulate what you get with deep brain stimulation, electrical stimulation, you basically have a headset. It's, it's a large thing, and people are less interested um, just the, the aesthetics of, you know, wearing something large. Uh, what do you think about perspectives of the direct brain uh, computer communication using of EEG? Yes, let's say that once more. Um, uh, electron for, uh, no, say, say it again. <laughs> uh, what do you think about perspectives of the direct brain computer communication with using of EEG. So direct brain communication from a brain to a computer. Brain computer interface. Uh, it, it happens, it's a real thing. So, you know, I talked about, uh, if you remember the slide of uh, selectivity and sensitivity um, for different brain uh, or electrode locations. So EEG, if you're using the same way I do, you're talking about scalp electrodes. So that has a certain uh, limitation for how well uh, we can localize a source target. And also it has a limitation on um, the, the bandwidth of information that we can get through. So uh, for example, um, if you know the, the P300 system, for example, do you know what that is? So people who have uh, uh, locked in syndrome, or who have high spinal cord injury or other diseases where they have uh, essentially no ability to communicate with their body, um, what you're talking about has been used. So it's scalp electrodes, not very invasive, and it records uh, information. Uh, it's, it's a pretty simple process. What happens is a person will wa watch as a cursor moves across a screen over a bunch of um, letters. And when they see the one that they want, they imagine something. And it's called the P300 because there is a characteristic uh, EEG waveform that happens about 300 milliseconds after they focus their attention. So a third of a second later, you will pick up off scalp electrodes um, this characteristic waveform. And then the system will back up 300 milliseconds from there and figure out what letter were they looking at. And it goes on the screen. So the problem with that, it, it works for severely disabled people, like locked in people, but it's pretty slow. So it, it's better than nothing, right? It's better than not being able to communicate, but there is a limitation to how quickly you can get information out, the bandwidth. So for non-invasive systems like scalp EEG, 
uh, certainly it's being used and there may be some room for optimization, but there is, um, I think, fundamental limitations on, on bandwidth or you know, data flow out. You mentioned that uh, electronic devices can replace drugs, but drug selling and drug making is a huge market, a lot of money at stake. And my question is, what is the attitude of drug makers uh -huh. and drug sellers? Oh. Uh, do they try to block and somehow the development of the whole sphere? Yeah. Such a yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in, in the United States, uh, there's not a, I'm gonna, this sounds like my story has nothing to do with that, but it really does. Um, so, um, R.J. Reynolds, major tobacco manufacturer, many years ago, saw the handwriting on the wall when smokers start, uh, when, when their customer base started going away. So what did R.J. Reynolds do? They did the smart thing. They diversified and they started buying up other companies that had nothing to do with smoking because they knew they were going to dwindle down and become ineffective. So they slowly moved their business structure. Same thing is going on with the drug manufacturers. So there's one in particular, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, who knows it's coming. GSK is, a, is one of the, the top three or so drug manufacturers around the world. They're also pretty darn smart because they are now the leaders in electroceuticals. So they, uh, and actually in just the last one to two years, I mean, they are sucking up biomedical engineers left and right because I know uh, I can give you a list of my friends and colleagues who have recently moved over to GSK. They are buying into it. So this, the answer is no, they're not afraid of it. They embraced it and they're leading. is, uh, well, um, how uh, is uh, those augmentations of uh, or prosthesis in the human body uh, are, you know, mounted uh, irreversibly? Because uh, if, for example, I'm an amputee, yep. I purchase a prosthesis from, from me, and uh, which scientists tell me that uh, it's uh, the best and the newest in the field, yep. and two years later, uh, it uh, became, uh, they become just obsolete. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not sure if I got all of the questions. So what happens to the person that spends a lot of money to do that? Is, is that the question? Uh, how, how? Well, uh, are uh, uh, those uh, prostheses, um, uh, well, are, are they mounted in the human body irreversibly? Or you could uh, change your prosthesis in the future for the neuron. So there, there are a couple different uh, elements to the entire system. So there's the implantable portion of it, which as you can probably tell, I'm a fan of doing because it gives uh, really good sensitivity and selectivity and better control. It gives us that simultaneous multi-degree of freedom control. And then there's the external parts, the, the prosthesis itself. So one of the big issues that we uh, struggle with and are trying to solve uh, in the prosthesis community is the idea of interchangeability. So what that means is when I first design an implantable device and an external prosthesis, and maybe there's some middle pieces in there like algorithms that, that work between the implanted device and the prosthesis, I it would be really nice if that implanted device doesn't work with only one prosthesis, but it worked with lots of prostheses. And that algorithm in the middle could interpret information coming from lots of implanted devices and communicate with lots of prostheses. So we're trying to make it so that there is interchangeability. We can swap things out. And that's important because if you don't have that swap ability, then let's say, I've got one implanted device that only works with one algorithm that only works with one prosthesis. And that prosthesis manufacturer goes out of business. Or there's a new, cooler, better prosthesis. And for some reason, you know, I want to switch from another company. And I want to switch. Well, 
too bad. The only way I can switch that prosthesis is to get a new algorithm, which isn't a big deal, and a new surgery and a new implanted device. So what we try to do is break up, if you think of, you know, dashed lines between the, the various parts, we try to break it up so that we can swap out one part at a time. And so if there is either something better available or a failure of one part, you don't have to switch everything out. You can take out that one piece only and replace that one piece. Does that address your question at all? A little bit? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Of course. It's been very clear how to, how to use neural interfaces when, with entities, when the brain is intact and all the connections work. But how um, can you use uh, neural interfaces in the store patient uh -huh. when the brain um, connections are uh, disconnected? Yep. Uh, yep. Thank you. Great question. So, if you remember, I talked about. Um, the difference between functional electrical stimulation and therapeutic electrical stimulation. So functional electrical stimulation is intend intended to give an immediate um, uh, replacement use, even though the body may be broken. Whereas therapeutic electrical stimulation is intended to help uh, uh, support the body in its own repair process. So often with stroke, what we're trying to do with electrical stimulation is the latter, trying to help the brain repair itself more quickly. So um, one, just as an example, a, a clinical study that I was involved with a few years ago was with uh, Professor Jane Burridge at the University of Southampton. So this was a post-stroke arm rehabilitation study. So the brain has, as you may know, has great ability to, um, it's called plasticity, to change itself. And if we have a stroke, even if a certain part of that brain um, is irreversibly lost, what can happen is surrounding parts of the brain, the, the penumbra around the injury, uh, may start taking over the functions of that lost part of the brain. And we can speed up that process, and part of the way you speed up that process is to give the proper sensory feedback. So the sensory um, nerves are still working properly, right? In order to get, part of the problem is if we don't train a person who has had a stroke to do the right movements again, then the, the brain does not have the signals it needs to plastically, cha plastically change. On the other hand, if you, let's say a person has had um, a stroke and it, it affects the arm area, so the left arm uh, is severely disabled. So historically, it was known that training um, in proper use, doing the right sensory feedback, helps to plastically train, uh, change the brain. So what may have happened historically is we would get a, a physical therapist or an occupational therapist that helps the person and physically grabs the hand and arm and moves it in the right way, reaching out, grasping. And so what's happening there is we're sending the sensory signals back to the brain that says, this is what the pattern looks like. Now rewire yourself. And that helps. The problem with that is physical therapists, or occupational therapists are expensive. And they generally can't spend as much time doing it as it would be nice if they were. So it'd be great if we could do that for a few hours a day that's really hard to get a person that's going to do it for a few hours a day for several months. So a solution to that, and this is what was done with this study with Jane Burridge at, at Southampton, is we implanted uh, devices. If you remember the fellow I showed you with the, the big stimulator and then the small integrated circuit, that integrated circuit went into a device called the Bion, which is a small single channel electrical stimulator. So what we did was in these uh, seven subjects at University of Southampton, we would implant, uh, I think it was between five and seven, if I remember correctly, bions into uh, various nerves that uh, control, uh, that gave muscle control in the arm. And then we would program in the signals so they would reach, open the hand, grasp, and come back. And it was just highly repetitive. So then they would go through this training several hours a day of reach, grasp, close, come back. And 
it, the, the statistics on this were substantial. So these patients, post-stroke patients, had rather rapid improvement in their, uh, their and they were all patients who were at least two years post-stroke minimum. So they had gone through what would be classically be considered the, uh, the phase where they're getting back most of their um, uh, plastic change in the absence of uh, further assistance. And then we would implant these devices and go through this highly repetitive training, which because it was a piece of hardware, they could do it as much as they want. It's not an occupational therapist coming in and spending many hours a day. They could turn it on and, and just go crazy. And these people had really good um, recovery of, of uh, control. And that was the, the, uh, the concept was that we're uh, inducing natural plastic changes faster than would occur if you didn't have the sensory feedback. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. You're welcome. Thank you uh, something about the use of uh, neural interfaces after peripheral nerve damage. Uh, I mean uh, to stimulate uh, the growth of nerve fibers. So one of the uh, ways that stimulating regrowth has occurred is um, it was shown, I don't know how long ago, 60s or so. Um, I think the first person to show this is a fellow named Mu Mang Pu. And he showed that um, static electric fields will induce uh, fiber growth toward the cathode, I believe. Although it's, been, it's really an interesting literature base. Um, people argued back and forth about what the right way to do it is. Is it do, uh, do the, the growth cones of axons grow towards cathode? Do they grow towards anode? Do you, is it better to have a direct field? Is it better to alternate it? And there's you know, been a, a bit of um, uh, research on this. But what isn't argued is that an, an electric field um, will affect the ability of uh, axons to grow. So something, about, something in the growth cone orients towards an electric field. So people have built various types of electrodes, um, most commonly a, a sieve electrode. So this is, um, it, it's a ring that goes around the outside of, of a nerve uh, with a bunch, it's like a mesh in it so the axons can go through it. So what that does is it gets the electrodes down in real close to the fascicles and, and the individual axons. And those electric fields um, will in fact induce growth up to uh, several millimeters, if not over a centimeter. Thank you, Alex. Uh, you mentioned about the problems with the immune system, and um, how many of the cells are problems in the system today when we use um, invasive prosthetics and the invasive near interfaces, and is it trust uh, that suppressed in the system? How long the patient need to use these drugs? Because we use the main interfaces for a long time, and so do we need to use the drugs for a long time? So uh, the, the question is, what do we do to um, suppress the foreign body response mm -hmm. to implanted devices? Is that correct? Yeah. So. The, so, so the, the general solution is not immunosuppression. It is to design from the start with materials that are known to elicit zero to little um, biological response. So there's, you know, it, it's well understood that there's a long listing of preferred materials um, that elicit very small reaction, like silicone. You put silicone in the body, uh, generally the immune system pretty much ignores it or, or there's very minimal response to it. So uh, what we tend to do as biomedical engineers is go to our, our list of known goods, known good materials, and design using those. So for example, if you were to find a new material that's really highly effective at something, but it's not already known to be biocompatible material, you just bought yourself an extra five years in the, the process of getting it approved for commercial release because there's a lot of things that you're going to have to do to prove that it won't um, uh, cause an unacceptable immune response. More common in the design process is I just 
pull out my list of things. And that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. And I start from there. And it gives me a pretty, you know, pretty big set of things that I can work with. So my question is about the PR that you mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, as far as I understood, we implant the PR and um, brain tissue around it gets a little bit complicated, but it sends out protection yep. so that the impulse, the impulse still get through. But how doesn't the tissue get purificated around these protections? Are they too small for that? Yeah, that's exactly the right answer. So one of the uh, signals to the immune system uh, for walling something off is simply size. So uh, as a rule of thumb, you can think of most things that are under 10 micrometers. So that's about the diameter of a eukaryotic cell. So si the diameter of, of most cells is on the order of 10 micrometers. And once you get s that size or smaller, um, that's really helpful for the immune system to go, eh, you're okay. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wall you off. Once you get bigger than that, the immune system starts thinking, you don't belong. So it's what you said. These are really fine projections, a micrometer or less, and they just slip through and are not recognized as foreign. So if the foreign body is less than 10 micrometers in, the, in diameter, in size, the immune system doesn't, doesn't react to it? Yes, like that. L less. Less reactive. Yes. Uh, thanks for the lecture again. And uh, uh, I want to ask uh, whether you follow any research on uh, prosthetic eyes and uh, what are the new developments in this area? Because uh, the last I uh, heard was uh, rather uh, crude uh, matrices like uh, uh, people could recognize some colors and basic shapes, but not much more. Yeah, so there's um, two companies around the world that I'm aware of. Um, one is uh, Second Sight, uh, SSMP Second Sight Medical Products. They're in the Los Angeles area. And the other is uh, a German company, and I'm blanking on the name right now, I'm sorry. Um, they have slightly different approaches. Um, Second Sight I'm a, a little bit more familiar with. So I think they're probably the one you're talking about. So their first electrode was, uh, electrode array was 16 electrodes. So it gave a, a pixelation of four by four. Mm -hmm. Pretty crude, but if you have no vision, it's better than nothing. Yeah, at least but, you could find a window or a negative. Right, right. So, you know, the people that had, were mostly blind, were happy to have a four by four array. We think of that as pretty bad. If you're blind, it's not so bad. Their next version, they went from 16 to 60 electrode array, 60. Um, so that was an eight by eight missing the corners, I think it is, six, 60 pixels. So getting better. Um, they, so Second Sight has recently changed their strategy. As of a few years ago, they had a progression listed. Their, their trajectory, company trajectory was to go from 16 to 60 to 256 or they're about to 1,000. That's what they were gonna do. I, I think the last one that they put in, uh, spent a lot of development time on was the 60 electrode array. So that's, it's a epiretinal stimulator. So put on the, the retina itself. They've changed their focus. Instead of putting their time and money into improving the epiretinal stimulator, they're now working on a cortical stimulator that goes on the occipital lobe. So straight projection, into projection, projecting not uh, direct uh, pixels, but uh, the signals that uh, the retina and the surrounding uh, neurons uh, produce after they have been encoded into the uh, brain. Yeah, so, so the V1 center in the occipital lobe, lobe has pretty good mapping. As you get into, if you know vision, then as you get into other centers, things get more complex. So, you know, we're looking at edges and you're looking at movement and all kinds of things. But in, in V1, it's a pretty simple mapping. So the, the bigger problem is really not mapping. It becomes making devices that are uh, uh, compatible and stable. So we want to be able to put electrodes into the brain, like the Utah electrode race. <laughs> As a matter of fact, 
So if you all remember the Utah electrode array that I had shown you a few times, when that was designed by uh, Professor Dick Norman at the University of Utah back in the late 90s, it was, its original intent was as a vis visual prosthesis. However, for reasons I don't fully understand, it, it didn't get implemented um, at least well as a visual prosthesis electrode. But nonetheless, even though that didn't follow through into a visual prosthesis, Second Sight now is going down that road with a different type of electrode, but nonetheless it is a, a fine pitch device intended to go into occipital lobe. Sure. So are, are you talking about stimulating signals that, that are meant to stimulate a, a, an axon? Answer that first because it's a sim little bit simpler answer. Um, in recording, uh, if we are to record signals from a, uh, a microelectrode placed close to uh, uh, the, the target or the source, rather, um, it is fairly well known and fairly stereotypical signals that the action potentials from either an individual axon or from groups of axons that are firing together. They're, they're really well known, they're characterized, and we know what those look like. So that's not a big challenge to uh, recognize them. As you get farther away, so for example, doing a surface recording, if you're using surface electrodes, which are uh, not invasive, so that's a good thing, um, now we have to start spending a lot of uh, cognitive effort into the modeling of what a signal looks like when it comes from thousands or hundreds of thousands of different firing muscle fibers, for example, or, or axons. And that, that's a, a very active area of research. Um, so with uh, a prosthesis control, uh, when we're recording from muscle fibers that are, that are contracting, um, there's a big effort in pattern recognition to be able to decode what is a, a complex set of multiple muscle fibers firing from different types of muscles and figure out how much of it came from this muscle, how much it came from that muscle, and so on. Active area of research. So on to stimulation, um, also an active area of research. So the more crude method, which is what has been mostly done up to this time, has been um, a, a fairly uh, simple set of uh, just uh, rectangular pulses. Uh, we'll use a, a, what's called a biphasic charge balanced pulse. So we get a, a cathodic pulse with a certain pulse amplitude and pulse width, but a rectangular shape, and then reverse it with a, an anodic pulse of a certain pulse amplitude and pulse width, but still rectangular. And that's done to reverse the electrochemistry at the electrodes so we don't get tissue damage or corrosion. Um, and, and that's kind of been the gold standard for a long time, and it works pretty well. But now, if you remember, I talked about, and that works really quite well for efferent signal, motor signals. But for getting uh, naturalistic sensation back, it's a t the charge, it's the pulse width gets modulated. And what that tells me, interestingly enough, and, and we've known this for some time, is that the, br the, the nervous system operates in an environment of noise. We've always got lots of stuff that we have to filter out that's not part of the signal. So what, what's going on is if we stimulate sensory nerves with something that has no noise in it, that's, it's, it's like a, you know, a pure sine wave, a pure tone, or equivalently a pure train of rectangular pulses, the brain says, ah, who are you trying to kid? That's, that's, not, that's not a sensory input. I've never seen that before. 
But as soon as we start adding noise in, it starts going, wow, wow, with a pulse width, which seems really strange, then the brain goes, oh, it's noisy. That's natural. And I asked Dustin about this once, a great guy, a good friend of mine. And I asked him, I was, I was just amazed that he thought of this. How, how, do you, how, did that, how did he ever come up with that? You know, I'm awed by his brilliance. And it goes back to the, um, I, I forget who's famous for this quotation, that success is 1% um, uh, inspiration and 99% perspiration. And that was his answer. I said, how did you ever come up with this? And he said, lots and lots and lots of hours of trying absolutely everything I could possibly think of. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So thank you, Dan, and uh, let's give uh, the last round of applause to our lecture tonight.